break. This is Chris. He describes himself as a free software hacker, musician, game developer, and reasonably bearded, which <laughs> appears accurate to me. So uh, he's going to talk about infinite 8-bit platformer. Take it away. I had a bit of a shave before I came, so not as bearded as normal, but <laughs> somewhat bearded. Um, last year I um, spoke a bit about Infinite 8-Bit Platformer, uh, my game project, and I'm now into the, nearing the th end of the, th well, about the middle of the third year of developing it. Um, so it's been a bit of a labour of love. It's taken me a while to get here. Um, these are my details. Um, so here are the most salient things about Infinite 8-Bit Platformer. Well, I haven't written up there that it's written in Python, but that's kind of obvious. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Uh, it's free software, so we all know what the advantages and disadvantages of going with free software are. <laughs> Basically means um, that if anyone wants to hack on it, they have to give the contributions back. Um, and they're free to distribute it, copy the binaries for other people, etc. Um, it's GPL version 3. Um, it's multiplayer. Uh, that's new since last time I spoke about it. Um, I had just got the multiplayer code working, but it wasn't yet at the point it is now where you can actually have multiple people playing the game at the same time and doing all the stuff you can do in the game. Um, <coughs> it's actually more of a, a virtual world than a video game. So I've, I've said here a cross between a wiki and a world. Um, hopefully that creates the right image in your mind of a wiki as you know, a text document that multiple people can work on at the same time and edit. Uh, and this game is a virtual world or a, a series of levels that people can collaborate on and work on at the same time. Um, of course it uses Python and uh, the library, underlying library I'm using to do that is Pygame. Uh, how many people here have used Pygame? Okay, cool. Great stuff. Um, uh, especially the last version of Pygame. It doesn't, you know, they don't have releases that often, I don't think, but the last version put in a whole bunch of stuff that's been very useful. Um, just some, like, philosophical things here. Uh, there are no baddies in this game and no killing. Um, it's basically an exploration game. So the idea is it's this big virtual world that multiple people can log into and collaborate on, and there's, it's, it's, not a, it's not a competitive game, it's more of a social game, it's more of an explorative, creative game. Um, and I, I purposely did that. I, thi I think there's, there's not, you know, there's a big emphasis when you're writing a game, the first thing that jumps to your mind is make it competitive, make it... It's very easy to create a shooter, for example. I, I, mean, I mean easy as in coming up with the ideas, because there's so much to borrow from as well out there in the world that, are, that already are based around this idea of killing bad guys. Um, but I think it's uh, maybe not such a good thing culturally. Um, all right, I'll show you a demo. So I've got it running here locally on my laptop. This is the server. Uh, this font's probably too small, isn't it? Well, whatever. Uh, I'm just running a local version because I don't want the network to go down or anything like that. Um, so the server started, and I'll connect to the local host server. And here it is. So basically the way you play this is to run around, um, collect items, and explore levels. So you can do all the normal type platformery things, jumping up and down. You can collect these little sheep here. Um, and then you have these things which are portals. So you can run into a portal, and there's a new level there. Now, these um, levels, were these two were created by me, actually. I think this one might have been someone else, but you can click on this button here, and you get some more buttons. So you've got a back button over here on the left. That just takes you back to the last teleport portal you ported through. So this is when we came into the level, and if you run off it, then you can go back again. And then that's taken me back to the previous level. Whoops. Yeah, and this is, there's, this is the whole no-killing thing. It just jumps you back. So you get like a little bit of a feeling of, ooh, I just stepped off the platform, but it's not the end of the world. You can just continue. Um, so it's very much non-competitive. But so what you do is walk around exploring, collecting items. Now, you also have these other icons up here, which are edit, lock, and new. So this level here is locked. It's one of the built-in levels when you first log into the game, so I locked those ones. 
But if you want to, you can press this button here, which is new, and create a completely blank new level. Now it starts you in, you, you were in edit mode to, in order to get to that new button. You had, you had to click the edit mode icon. Now once you're in, once you've created your own level, you can edit it as you please. So that includes things like, here we've got the regular type of um, drawing tool. So you've got an airbrush, fill, draw, like a pen style draw, and draw line. So let's just um, get a fill thing here. And we'll fill in, let's get a better color. This one here. Let's make the portal pink too. And we'll make this one gray. And we'll put some of these lines around the edges. So you can see that basically you can just edit whatever graphics you like on there. Um, now, once I've created this level, oh, and w one great thing to do once you've created a block is use the clone tool, which is here. So you've got clone, move, and delete. So move, obviously you can grab things and move them around. Um, clone, you can clone something you've previously made. Now that one's really useful for making larger levels because you make three or four things, maybe a um, draw a tree or something like that, and then you can clone them and make lots of copies of them. So here I can make a more complicated level by cloning things. Oh, whoops. The uh, collision detection there is done on a rectangle, so I have to give them enough room to move around. So, but once you've designed your level, you can go up here to the level naming. So here's your level name. At the moment, it's just called 410, which means it's like the 410th level on the server that's been created. <coughs> so we'll call it um, Hello Land. Now, someone else can log in. I could tell someone else, go check out my level. It's called Hello Land. And to do that, you can teleport. So I'll teleport to a level someone else has made, Crystal. And it crashes. <laughs> Let's try that again. Maybe I'll teleport to a different level. I've probably left Crystal unlocked and some editing command bug I haven't fixed yet. But so anyway, we can go down here and go teleport to hello, hello land. And you can see it receiving the 1,142 1, updates and drawing the level there. And so now, if someone else logged into this same level, we could see them as well um, running around. And you can use the chat down here. So you can do, uh, if you use the chat box without a forward slash, so the forward slash commands are like forward slash teleport, um, forward slash help is another one that shows you the website help. <coughs> and you can say hello, and your little person there says hello. and anyone else who's logged in can see that. So it's standard kind of multiplayer thing. And so um, the other things you can do up here are create a ladder. So you can create a ladder like this and run up it. And you'd obviously use this one here to draw in some bars. So you're actually running on something. Um, and then clone this guy, put it up here. So then you can run on, okay. So that's, that's basically how it works. You can create items as well, fill them in, and you can collect them. Yep. So that's the game in essence. And the idea is that people can share these levels with each other and actually they can collaborate and create a portal and link their portal to someone else's portal. So you'd link this one, you see the little portal icon here, you click on that, and then you go to the level that you want it to teleport to. Um, and, it, and then link it, and then whenever anyone's on this level, they can go through that portal to join the other level. So it's kind of like a hyperlink on the web. The hyperlink points at some other level um, and directly to a portal. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the editing of the game in a nutshell. And when other people come here, if you lock it, you can lock your own level so no one else can edit it. Then when they'll just see this, you know, like how it looks without any, um, it's got an invisible ladder there, but that's what they'll see. Um, and you can make these levels, they're 1024 by 1024 pixels, so you can make quite a large complicated level. Um, and that's, that's the game in a nutshell. Um, 
So I'm just going to go through a quick timeline of the life of this game. Uh, 2010, it started in early 2009, 2010, 2011, it's still going. Um, so it started life as a little experiment called Minimalist Platformer. And what that basically was, was I just made a platformer that was just blocks. So I kind of abstracted away the, what the core concept of the game was and just wrote that as a library first. So, you know, as a programmer, you're, I'm always doing this too much, like abstracting everything too much. But I also wanted to get something releasable and I wanted to make sure the build um, system was able to build for all the platforms I wanted to target in the end. So, and that's what Minimalist Platformer did. I had executables for Windows, Mac, and uh, Linux. I just left the source code as, as I usually do. Um, so Minimalist Platformer, then the first cross-platform build um, of, of Influent Platformer itself was in June 2009. Um, just a bit of geography here. I was living in London with my wife for the first bit of the game and Perth for the this second bit of the game. Um, so it was spread across two locations. Um, the first contribution from someone was in November 2009. Uh, that was just as we left London. Uh, a guy from Perth actually sent me a patch to fix a Windows thing, so that was really nice. Um, Pre-alpha testing happened in March. Uh, the first levels and tools that someone contributed were here. My friend Crispin sent through the airbrush tool, a patch for that, and uh, some great levels as well. Um, multiplayer, I first started here, and then PyCon AU happened just after that, so I didn't really have working multiplayer yet. But you can now, if you download the game off the website and you play with other people, you'll all be in the same level. And the editing commands all work there as well. This big gap here is where my uh, daughter was born. Um, just show a couple of pictures. <laughs> of course, you know, I'm not biased or anything, but I think she's going to be pretty smart. That, I, I love this photo because it basically sums up how I want people to feel when they play Infinite Platformer, like just that sense of joy and, uh, you know, new things. Um, pre after she was born, uh, I managed to get a whole bunch of hacking in there in February and March um, and then did the release in May 2011. So it's actually available now on the website for um, Windows, Linux and Mac. Um, Linux users still have to download the source, but I don't, I, I don't really know a good way to package up for Linux. I'm sure there is one, but Linux users seem to be okay generally with downloading the source. So what's next? Um, better help and instructions. Lots of users have requested that. Uh, there's a guy called John Ratke, I think his name is pronounced, um, who did this message sign patch, so when you go onto a level, there'll be a sign there, and you can read what someone's left, uh, a little message there. Um, avatar customization is a big one, lots of people have asked for, so making, your, making you the little, man, the little dude look well, however you like. Um, and chat improvements, because at the moment the chat's kind of awkward, it's on the player, there needs to be a bit of a history happening there, and an ability to tell who's saying what. It gets very confusing when we're doing multiplayer testing. Um, and I'd like to set up registration in a forum on the website, so when you, when you click through on the, in the game, you'll be able to register your particular copy, um, and that means it'll, you'll take all your levels with you, so you'll always be able to authenticate against the server. Uh, so how do you contribute if you would like to hack on this a bit? Uh, these instructions are just directly off the website, so if you go to infiniteplatformer.com, you can check out these instructions. But it's, it's quite simple. I'm using Bazaar to version. Um, you check out the source code, check out the library pod 6 net, and um, check out the pod 6 library. Those are the libraries I developed for building other games, but I also use them in this one. Um, here's the dependencies. Pretty much, pretty straightforward. And these are different commands. So you can do, you can run it normally, the client normally, um, you can run the server here, this fourth line down here. Um, and there's this great new thing I added recently, which is the server console, which lets you actually, it gives you a live Python prompt inside the server. So you can, you can do stuff like inspect how many clients there are and all that. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through the Pod6 library. It's so graphics abstraction, input abstraction, and entity management is basically what it does. So it makes writing games with Pygame easier. Um, it looks like this. So you've got an entity class. Uh, and there's this thing called concurrent, which is a, a mix-in that allows you to, it basically gives your entities these update and draw things that happen automatically. So it's, it's doing a basic concurrency without having to use threading or something like that. Um, and it, captures, it catches events using this event monitor mix-in as well. 
those events are standard Pi game kind of events like key down space. So you just create a method called key down space, and when you hit when the player hits space, it calls this function. So it saves a bit of the uh, messing around that you normally have to do. Um, yeah, and here's how you manage your entities. Add a new entity, get rid of them. Oh, and the entities are all hierarchical, so you, you have these hierarchies of entities and it draws them, so it'll draw the parent entity first, then all their children. So you can build you know, complex interfaces and stuff like that quite easily. Um, so this is the pod6 net library, which is the network library I wrote on top of async core and async chat in the, um, uh, in the Python standard library. And they once again are just there to make life easier for someone trying to write a game, a, a Python game, network-based game. Um, quite a few people that, uh, ha have used this already for their own projects. There's a thing called Construct for Windows, which is like a Windows um, uh, game development library. And uh, yeah, some people have used this inside Construct apparently with uh, great success. But it lets you, so in your client, you, you just have to do this once every frame this uh, pump thing, and it'll automatically call your um, methods that are named network underscore whatever if the sender has a key in the data it sends um, called action. Oops, I've actually written that wrong. That should say action hello. So if someone sends a packet of data with action hello, it'll call this network hello. So it's quite simple. Um, and this is the, on the server side, you have a representation of the client. So you've got this client channel, which is a representation of your client. And once again, you've got these named methods, which when data comes from the client with action hello, the server will see network hello. And it's got this basic send, which you just send Python structures. So, uh, you know, dictionaries or lists or whatever. Um, this is the actual server itself. When someone connects, you get this connected, and you tell it you want to use the ch the channel class you just we just saw. So um, yeah, you can throw that all together quite easily. And this is an example of running the server, just once per frame running this um, method here. So that's uh, that's my talk, and uh, I just wanted to say thanks to these people: Chris Ben Wellington, Patrick Mullen. Julian Habrock, John Ratke, and Brad Power, and Shannon Lawton. These are all people who have contributed code. I uh, hope I didn't forget anyone. Um, yeah, and uh, thanks for having me. And you should play the game.